Good afternoon. Uh, it has been a full day of policy discussions, and thank you all for your active participation throughout the day. It is uh, now the time of the program uh, to listen about the updates from partners and organizations <laughs> from outside the APNIC uh, region and other global processes. We have eight reports in about 90 minutes, uh, basically 10, 11 minutes per report. So we should be able to answer a question or two. So I would like to welcome AFTAP. Uh, he will be doing two reports. Uh, one is an update uh, about the activities of the Address Council of the Address Supporting, or, uh, supporting Organization of ICANN, as he's currently the chair. And secondly, he will speak as a co-chair of our working uh, group for the ASO review. So he will give an update of how that process is going. Thanks. Thank you, Pablo. Um, hello, everyone. Aftaf Siddiqui again. So uh, as, I, as Pablo said, I have two presentations and a very limited time. So I'll just uh, quickly go through this. Uh, if you have any question, please, you can ask uh, anytime. And otherwise, I'll be available uh, after the session as well. So this is the ICANN ASO update. Um, as, uh, as Pablo ex explained, um, this is the ASO AC update. Who we are? We are the uh, NRO number council, uh, 15 members, three from each region. Uh, I represent Asia Pacific region, APNIC, alongside uh, me. We have uh, Simon Sohail Baroi and uh, Brajesh Jain, who's sitting here. Um, currently, the, for this year, I'm the chair, and we have uh, two vice chairs as well. So, what do we do? We do, we elect uh, a ASOC chair per December, two vice chairs are there, term four chair and vice chairs one year, we have to uh, elect a chair and appoint two vice chairs every year. This is the list of all the ASO, AC, NRO, NC members um, and their terms. And uh, as per the policy, we are obliged to post uh, our meeting attendance as part of the uh, transparency and accountability that uh, we do. So far, uh, January and February, we had two meetings, and this is the attendance for uh, all those meetings. We have uh, monthly meetings, uh, um, it's like once every month, and uh, we can have uh, a special meeting in case if something is required to be discussed. So the most important thing, what we do is we elect two uh, board members with the ICANN. And uh, last year we uh, elected uh, one board member for seat nine, and uh, that was uh, Ron De Silva from the Aran region. Uh, this year uh, the s election for seat 10 will happen, and uh, currently the seat 10 is represented by Maima Rakinuri, who's sitting here. Uh, he has served uh, on the seat for last three years. That's and, 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 yeah, it's okay. I think we are back. Yes. Okay, I'll just carry on. If it stops, just say something. All right, so C10. Um, um, nomination phase uh, started, nomination phase was closed uh, on November 38th, 2018, last year. There were three nominations, um, Dimitri Barkov, Akinori Mayamura, uh, NDL Ankaba. And uh, out of these three, um, NDL Ankaba withdraw his nomination uh, this month, a couple of weeks ago. So these are the important dates to remember. Uh, nomination phase was from 15th of September till 30th of November. There was a comment phase. People did uh, provide their comments uh, on the ASOAC website, on the ASO website. ICANN due diligence process started uh, from 1st January to 15th, 15th January. Currently, we are in the interview phase. Uh, the interview will be conducted uh, by the ASOAC. 
All this information is publicly available on the ASO websites. So if you have any question and concern, you can go and check out the details. So the other thing is we have appointed one person from the ASO AC uh, to support the NOMCOM uh, selection process as well. Uh, currently, it is for the 19, 2019, it is Brajesh Jain, uh, who is uh, working on behalf of the uh, ASO AC to support the NOMCOM selection process, election process. All the activities are available on the website, aso.ican.org. If you have any question concern, please ask. Going one, going two, going three. If you don't have any question, I can start the next presentation. So I can give you the f uh, background of that is uh, in 2017, uh, mid-2017, uh, we got the ASO review. Uh, we got the report for the ASO review. As per the ASO review, uh, there were 18 recommendations. And the 18th, I mean, there were 18, 18 recommendations. Some recommendations were for NROEC, NEC, some recommendations were for ASO AC, and then it combined, and some were to update the MOU. But the recommendation number 18 uh, was most important. It was the NRO should initiate a public consultation involving the five RIR communities to determine the future structure of the ASO. Uh, APNIC uh, uh, EC decided uh, that we should have uh, a strong consultation process within the uh, APNIC region, uh, and that's why a working group was formed. We had three sessions uh, in APNIC 44, APRICOT 2018, and APNIC 46. All sessions were very well attended. Productive discussions uh, were carried out and resulted in many uh, solutions and suggestions. So at the end of the last uh, meeting, we conducted a survey, um, and the response uh, were very clear. Uh, it was very evident from the, the consultation process as well. So I'm just reading out from the uh, consultation um, survey. So the community said, yes, uh, number community should continue to provide to directors of the ICANN board. Uh, yes, the number of community, sh uh, number community should continue to be part of ICANN's empowered community. And uh, they said, when engaging with the ICANN, the number community should do so in the name of ASO. Uh, yes, the global team comprised of community and organizational members should be established for the negotiation with the ICANN or ASO review. So that was the uh, sentiment uh, from the APNIC community. And it was shared uh, with the NROEC in journal. So what are the next steps? Uh, uh, we, provided the, uh, we provided the feedback to the NROEC. They, uh, they were a larger consultation process in every RIR. And um, the last one was at EFRENIC. Uh, it has been completed. The all consultation, consultation process is complete. And uh, now NROEC has to make uh, a final uh, decision or update us. So we are just waiting for the formal update from the EC. Uh, they have to review it, review all the consultation process. We expect that any final decision would reflect the community sentiments. Uh, and we also expect that a strict timeline should be followed, as we have already spent almost two years. And if there are any further updates, we will share it on uh, the working group mailing list and on uh, APNIC talk mailing list. And uh, if you have any question or concern, you can share it on, uh, you can ask uh, right now or on the mailing list, and I'll happy to update and provide you more details if required. On that note, it was quick. Thank you so much. I hope it was self-explanatory. If not, then you can ask question. Now, thank you. Let's move to the beautiful region of Latin America. We have uh, Sergio from Blacknik. Uh, he's the head of registration services. Welcome, bienvenido. Thank you, Pablo, for the introduction. 
Um, as Pablo mentioned, my name is Sergio Rojas. I'm, I'm working at LACNIC in Registration Services Department. As you know, uh, LACNIC is based in Uruguay, uh, the other part of the planet. So we don't know a lot of Korea, uh, except some K-pop music that is cool, or Wapangamnan style, you know. Um, sorry about this joke. It was just to break the ice and, and to hide my nerves. It, it, anyway, it didn't work. I'm still nervous. <laughs> well, but um, anyway, um, I will try to find some free time to visit some places and of course to um, make new friends with the APNE community. So I'm very happy to be here again. Let's start with, with my presentation. Um, in this presentation is divided in three uh, topics. The first one is um, about excellence in internet number resources management where I'm going to present some reports about um, customer satisfaction survey, um, IPv6 deployment, um, soft landing policy, and, and more. The second topic um, about continuous strengthening of secure, stable, open, and continuous growing internet, where I'm going to present some um, IPv6 development um, reports and training. And the last uh, topic, promoting and enriching a participatory bottom-up internet governance model. Well, first um, slide. Every two years, we do a um, customer satisfaction survey that is usually con conducted by Merco Plus. It's an international uh, company based in Uruguay. And during the last year, we got 90%, 92% of uh, customers that are either satisfied and very satisfied. Where, um, of them, 68% are very satisfied. And, well, which is a very good number. Um, if you compare with the last um, two period in 2018, uh, sorry, 16 and 14, as you can see, 59% um, uh, was very satisfied in 2014. And in 2016, 54%. Um, um, and last year, 68%. Well, here you can see the evolution of our membership. Um, most of them are in a um, smaller category, like nano or micro category that is oriented to internet providers. And as you know, we have two NIRs in Brazil and Mexico. An organization that receives resources from, from that NIR are member of LACNIC as well, and is uh, in this chart. I mean, include uh, in this chart, and, and, and we have right now almost 9,000 uh, members. What we know, realize, or notice uh, since 2016, we increased the 50% of our membership, and this is because we are in the last phase um, of IPv4 exhaustion period. And, well, I'm going to talk about it in the following slide. We started the phase three of the exhaustion period. It's like you have the, uh, the last period that you allocate from the last slash eight. But the difference is that we are allocating from a slash 10 and 11. It's kind of six million IP addresses. That is only for new entrants. An organization can receive just only one allocation. The maximum allocation is slash 22 and the minimum is slash 24 for end user or for internet providers. The current available space in this pool is 2.3 million addresses. And according to the behavior, we expect that this space will end in the middle or beginning of, of 2020, next year. Resource transfer. Um, we have intra-IR transfers. Uh, Inter-IR transfer is not permitted. Uh, it is um, a jury proposal and to be discussed and to be presented in, in our um, policy forum. Thanks, Jordi. <laughs> and it, it is, uh, since 2000, I think we started this, this um, policy implementing in 2016, at the end of 2016, but it is, there is not a, a lot of uh, transfer. We finish or we approve uh, until now 33 transfer in our region. And in this chart, you can see the amount of IP addresses transfer in, in our region by countries. 
Um, if you want more information, you can visit our website. You can get there more um, chart. But here, um, just to mention, Colombia is the country that received um, more IP addresses due to this transfer. Um, followed by Curaçao and then Aruba. Well, three seats in the board um, had to be renewed. Um, we received 10 candidates from dif eight different countries. The result was Alejandro Guzman from Colombia was re-elected. And then Esteban Lescano from Argentina and Evandro Varonil from Brazil were elected for the first term. Milagnik, um, it is like uh, my, my APNIC portal as well, but we call it Milagnik in Spanish. Um, and Milagnik is a customer portal released in 2017. Basically, it was developed in house. And the idea was to um, put all the system that we had on the internet in just one system and getting the possibility to add um, more module and improve the user experience. The first release um, include IP and AS reverse DNS administration, RPKI, and for the first time we implemented uh, online payment and account statement. Then we added many other um, services like um, transfer list listing services uh, and membership module. Oh, something that I forgot to mention here in transfers is that um, in 2018 we uh, implemented a new services called uh, transfer listing services that I think you have uh, in your region as well. And basically, is the, these um, services make the possibility to um, offering company, receiving company, and IP brokers can contact each other in order to transfer um, an, an IP before range. Um, it is not completely open. Uh, I mean, members can apply, but it has to be... Um, we have to analyze their request, and if it is approved, it is published, but it's, uh, it's not public. Uh, only um, organization that apply for this service can um, watch the organization that are, um, that are in the list. Um, let's say, or, um, receiving organization, or offering organization, or intermediate, or IP brokers. Well. Next topic, strengthening a secure, stable, open, and continuously growing internet. We are um, still working strongly in RPKI implementation, um, doing some webinars, uh, tutorial in our um, annual event, or even a face-to-face -face meeting uh, during our event in order to clarify any doubts about uh, RPKI implementation. On the other hand, um, during the last year, we have installed two copies of the root server. The I copy was uh, installed in, Mon in Mexico, Monterrey, and the K copy was installed in Panama City. Um, IPv6. This chart you can um, in this chart you can see that um, the highest coverage of the five areas announced uh, an IPv6. Uh, prefix. We use this. Um, we use the um, Rive NCC tools uh, in order to get this this chart. You can visit this website if you want to if you want to uh, make your own query. And there is uh, almost 8,000 ASN visible in the region, where more than 3,000 announce on IPv6. That it doesn't mean that that they are using v6. It is announced. To to know that. Um, if they are using v6, we use the Google uh, um, statistic to know about the using of um, IPv6 um, resources. Um, in this list, you can see the countries that um, that are using v6. Yeah, in the first example, for example, you can see that Uruguay, the total of traffic that that, that Google received, 34% are in v6. And the countries that are um, in red color uh, means that is the first time that we receive um, traffic in V6. Training. Uh, we have trained almost 5,000 
um, people during the last year in BGP, security, internet governance, and IPv6. And that's a lot of, of, of number because we publish our webinars and videos on, on YouTube and we're counting um, the people who watch this, this video. And we have the LACNIC campus as well that is a virtual um, platform where, where um, the student can follow uh, or learn about um, IPv6 and BGP and RPKI. During 2018, um, we had three, uh, five edition in IPv6 basics, three edition in IPv6 advanced, and three edition of um, BGP plus RPKI. And during the last year, we have trained um, more than 1,500 people in IPv6 and almost 500 um, people in BGP. Um, about um, routing security project, like Nick and the Nick, the um, Nick MX, it's time. Okay, um, we are working uh, to develop um, um, RPKI validators, and the goal is to develop this validator to promote the deployment of, of this validator in in the lag region. If I'm not wrong, uh, we are using um, uh, the RIPE NCC validator. And the last point is to document routing incident. Um, by a tracking tool. Frida is one of our social program. Um, I don't have, well, we don't have a lot of time, so if you want to know more about Frida, you can visit this website, uh, because Paolo is saving time. Um, but, uh, well, there was, uh, there was um, focus on, on digital gap through community networks and closing the gender uh, dividing technology. Then IGTIC is our, another, um, another social program as well developed for Haiti. Haiti is an island shared with the uh, Dominican Republic. Um, it was focused on two um, important points point as well, training women and training technicians uh, in order to strengthen the internet infrastructure in this island. Google and LACNIC workshop, we have organized uh, during the last year some training in Trinidad and Tobago, Guatemala, and Dominican Republic. We have trained more than 100 people in this project, still working with some country um, on the creation of a network operator group or internet exchange point. Last topic. I will finish in a few minutes, Pablo. Um, well, uh, here in the last part of the chart, you can see the amount of um, proposal that was presented. And, and we know that we have more participation from, from our community. The yellow bar uh, showing the amount of proposal uh, presented in 2018, and the, and the um, blue bar, for example, is um, corresponding to the 2017, and the, and the red bar was uh, for 2016. And we know that, yeah, there are more participation from, from our community. It's not a lot, but, well, it's a good... Um, it's a good number that we want to share with you. Um, this is a small report about our um, annual event, LACNIC 29, that was held in Panama last year. Um, LACNIC 13 and, LAC and LACNOC 18 in, in Argentina. In both, we had more than 100 participants and more than 2,000 uh, remote participants. And then we have the uh, smaller um, uh, local events that we call LACNIC on the move. We organized in June of last year in Paraguay and then in Trinidad and Tobago as well where we have more than 100 participants. Well, this is a good news. Uh, let me tell you that for the seventh years in a row, we are in the ranking of the best place to work. So during the last uh, year, in 2018, we got the second position of the best place to work in Uruguay. So we are very happy and we're really proud to be part of this great organization. And last one, uh, LACNIC 31, um, that we held in Republic and Dominican Republic in May. So you are invited 
to to participate in this in this event we don't we don't usually see a lot of people from 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 this community and of course you are invited your experience and your collaboration will be very uh, welcome and to to our region um, so if you can apply and that's all for me um, if you have any question I will be very happy to answer if not um, I'm able during the uh, break in or thank you very much time is now going to be relative to the time that you spent traveling here so he got a little bit more rush uh, from ISOC Thanks, Pablo. Good afternoon, everybody. If I can figure this out. Yes, I'm Raj from the Internet Society. Um, I'll try and make this quick. I thought I had 45 minutes, but obviously not. <laughs> um, I won't tell you all about what ISOC is. I'm hoping everyone in the room knows us, and we've been involved uh, in the Internet community for a long time, obviously. Uh, so I'll skip through all those. We do this every year. It's up here. Um, in, just to give you a snapshot of what's been happening in the region. So, uh, very quickly, uh, we still have roughly a third of ISOC members in the Asia PAC region. Uh, roughly 10% year on year growth in that. Uh, 21 chapters. Uh, obviously, not all individual members are part of chapters, so there's a subset of that 21,000, and 20 organizational members called the Asia Pacific Home. Uh, staff and team pretty much unchanged. We have one new addition, this young fellow in the front here, uh, who joined us in January. Uh, he's based out of Singapore, that's Adrian. The rest I think you know, you have from AFTA before, who's also part of the team. Uh, two of our trustees, board of trustee members, are also uh, in the Asia PAC region, Asaki san in Japan and uh, Harish Pillay in Singapore. Some very quick highlights of what we did. So this is the overall snapshot. Um, we are present in about 30 economies in the region. Lots of speaking engagements. You saw from the list before that we're a very small team. Uh, so as you can imagine, everyone is scrambling most of the time uh, in order to do all this in what is the world's largest region, of course, half the world. Um, we support a lot of training programs. Obviously, we don't do all of that ourselves. We do them in partnership uh, and collaboration with others, including APNEC, uh, Apricot, obviously, and many NOGs around the region. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about that shortly. Uh, we do an, um, an annual survey, uh, the Internet Policy Issues in Asia Pacific Survey. Um, just a snapshot to show you there how that's been evolving over time. As you can see, some of those issues remain over many, many years. Um, Internet of Things popped up this year, uh, sorry, last year in our survey. The new survey that will do, it will be going out uh, most likely next month. Um, and that will actually cover the topic of consolidation. For those of you who were here during the opening, you had Andrew, our new CEO, speak about consolidation. Uh, so uh, uh, this year's survey will look at some of those uh, aspects of uh, how that's potentially going to shape the future internet, both technically and I suppose from the policy perspective. Um, you must have heard a, lot of bit, a little bit about our Mandras program, I hope. We've been uh, preaching that gospel for a couple of years now, particularly here at Apricot. Uh, last year, we signed a couple of MOUs. I'm sure you see some familiar faces uh, on, in, in those pictures. Uh, APNIC, of course, is an important partner and has been for many years for us. And we have signed an MOU with them where they also carry our training program on their portal. Um, in addition to that, the ISP Association of India uh, and Bangladesh, respectively, we signed uh, MOUs with them to try and see if they could promote uh, Mandras to their members. Uh, as well, NSRC. Um, we have a global uh, relationship with them, and they'll help us with uh, training and related work across the world, including here. Uh, one thing to note, uh, we have had good growth globally uh, with the Mandras program. However, the APEC region still is lagging behind, and you know, anything we can do to try and push that along, I think, would be quite nice. Um, we also launched an IXP initiative for Mandras. That seems to have uh, got better response in this region, but again, there's still more to be done. Um, at the policy level, uh, last week I was in Manila where we had the official launch of the Philippines National ICT Ecosystem Framework, which is basically the digital roadmap for the next five years. 
Uh, this was an interesting outcome. I know we've all been talking about multi-stakeholder models for a long time. Uh, in this instance, this is, as far as I'm aware, uh, the first country in the world which has actually used the multi-stakeholder model to actually develop its digital strat strategy. And when I say they've actually used it, which means you know, they've gone out to the provinces, they've got multiple sectors involved. It's not just the IT and telecoms folk, um, energy, health, agriculture, et cetera, et cetera, and all done in a very multi-stakeholder, highly consultative fashion. You know, not just putting something on a website and asking for public comments, which is not quite multi-stakeholder, although some people do say that's it. Um, so this was a nice uh, outcome, we thought, and it's something uh, we would encourage you to use in your own interactions if you want to demonstrate how people are using the multi-stakeholder model, particularly a government and a fairly large one at that with the Philippines being a large country in the region. That's a great example. We have lots of material on our website if you wish to refer to that. Um, Pablo, how much time do I have? Any indication? 20 minutes, okay. Um, our C and Pro Community Networks, we do a lot of work in this. Uh, very quickly, we had um, uh, last year, uh, we did a pilot program where we brought people from other regions of the world uh, to have an immersive training program uh, in, in India, where we've been working since 2010 uh, in this field. Uh, so you can see the list of uh, the regions they came from. Uh, very interesting program. And the thing was, you know, they get technical training. They also see how people use networks out in rural areas and then how, what sort of impact and difference that can make. IOD workshops, I'll skip over that, um, uh, but you know, we've done some work in India around that. Lots of community engagement with our chapters. Uh, Nepal uh, was the host of our event this year for the chapters. There's a whole bunch of other stuff we've done across the region. Again, I won't go through all that. You're welcome to look at the slides later. Still more, uh, including an IX in Pakistan, which of course APNIC and NSRC helped us with as well. Um, we're trying to get we're trying to get into the media if we can, hopefully in a good way. So we did pretty well last year uh, in some major flagship publications in the region. Uh, the bit on the right, of course, is the regional multilateral bodies we engage with, or largely multilateral bodies we engage with. Work in 2019, pretty much a continuation of what we've done in the past. Access and, access and trust remain our core pillars, uh, and the four buckets we have. Uh, I won't go through that again. You're welcome to look at the slides or our uh, website. I've talked about CNs already. Mandras, we all know what that is, so that's continuing this year. IoT security, in particular, we're looking at consumer IoT security, so wearables and things, so there's a lot of work happening in that. I feel that I'd invite you to have a look at uh, the literature we have on that. And last slide, uh, just for a quick snapshot of what we are doing in the region over the next couple of quarters uh, in yellow and in green or blue or whatever it looks like to you are some major meetings of note in the region. Um, obviously, there's ICANN next month, but there's, uh, uh, if you have an interest in the Pacific Islands, there's the PTA AGM. Uh, APRIGF, I should just flag that as well. Another hat away, I'm chair of APRIGF currently. Uh, that'll be in July in Vladivostok, uh, far eastern Russia, and we'd uh, love to see you there. Uh, IITF, of course, will be in Singapore in November as well, uh, and perhaps some of you will be able to make it to that. So with that, thank you very much. Keep in touch. That's how you can do it. And see you next year. Thank you. Thank you, Raj. Questions? I will now invite Joyce from ICANN. Thank you. Thanks very much, Pablo. Hello, everyone. I'm Joyce from ICANN. I'm based in Singapore, and Singapore is where the APAC regional office is based. So usually for this session, I would do a look back at what we've been doing for the past year, but we do have a very important meeting, uh, meeting coming up, so I'm going to spend more time on that. So the ICANN 64 Community Forum will take place in Kobe in about just short of two weeks' time. So from the 9th to 14th of March, 2019, and a quick scan in the room tells me I've got Akinori san who uh, is uh, part of the local host committee, uh, who is here. And if you have any questions about the meeting, logistics-wise, um, policy-wise, you know, do feel free to come and talk to us. Oh, sorry. Okay. So some focus areas um, in terms of hot topics for the meeting, we're looking at the future of ICANN. So ICANN has already been talking about the five-year strategic plan um, 20 to 21 to 2025, 
uh, for over the past year, actually, and we've held several community consultations as well. The draft strate strategic plan was already published for public comment, uh, and we'd uh, really, really encourage that if you're interested in looking at what's going on um, in ICANN's future and what would we be busy with, uh, to please look at this strategic plan. Uh, and we also have a board session on governance, which is for us to discuss what is going to happen with ICANN's uh, community multi-stakeholder model and how we're going to sort of organize ourselves and understand how the multi-stakeholder model works. So that's pretty interesting. Uh, if this is sort of your thing, uh, do come and join us for this session if you're in Kobe or if you are also online, you can join us uh, via remote participation. Okay, and then ongoing work, we always have our policy development processes running. Uh, the first of which is uh, a really hot topic. So that's the expedited policy development process that was launched last year uh, on a temporary specification, or colloquially we call it the TEM spec for GTLD registration data. So this came about because of GDPR that was um, in effect in May last year, uh, where we realized rather belatedly that our who is would be non-compliant. So the EPDP was basically launched to help us figure out how we could then implement changes to the who is uh, for us to be in compliance with uh, the GDPR. So they've issued, the team has issued the final report. They will only last for a year and they're not expected to go beyond a year for their work. Uh, it's, going out, it's gone out to the GNSO Council uh, and they will publish it for public comments before it goes for the final board approval. Another policy um, process that we've been keeping close watch on is the new GTLD subsequent procedures, PDP. Uh, so this has been ongoing for several years. Um, it's not going to end quite so soon, but they have issued their initial report, uh, various initial reports, because it's quite a big PDP, uh, where they've asked for public comments, and now they are going through the comments and figuring out uh, what to do next about it. Okay, so maybe a bit more relevant to this group would be some of the technical areas that we'll be focusing on. Uh, the first of which would be Tech Day. It would be held the entire day over several sessions. Uh, there was a call for proposals for Tech Day uh, to basically talk about anything and everything under the sun. It could be about emerging technologies, it could be about security, so it's really up to uh, the technical community to come up with whatever they want to talk about during Tech Day. There's also a session on emerging identifiers technology, which would be very interesting. And another one on uh, DNS abuse and uh, lessons learned on how .dk was able to sort of successfully reduce abusive domains. So I thought that might be interesting for some of you in the room who are looking to find out if there might be any best practices. Now, one more thing that I want to highlight is that very, very recently, just a few days ago, um, ICANN released uh, an announcement which called for full DNSSEC, DNSSEC meaning DNS security extensions deployment, uh, and to promote community collaboration to protect the internet. Um, if you've been reading the news, you've seen a lot of articles about um, attacks on the DNS infrastructure at a global level, and it's quite worrying. So ICANN has come forward with a checklist of items that you could consider um, employing um, in order to be more secure. And in this announcement, you will see a lot of different reference materials to help you with that. So I, I highly encourage you uh, to, if you want to download the presentation and then click on the link if you haven't already seen the announcement. For Asia Pacific itself, we have the APEC space taking place on Monday uh, after the welcome ceremony. We have the APEC social that's meant for the APEC community, so do join us. It's APEC social and also AP Relo networking event, so it's jointly hosted by, um, by us. Uh, and that's on Tuesday in the evening. And then we have a session on internationalized domain names, just a program update on Wednesday, and a cross-community session on universal acceptance and IDNs on Thursday, the final day of the event. Um, and also, um, just a quick snapshot of what are the ASO sessions that are taking place. Thanks, Aftab, for the um, update that you gave uh, just now. I don't see where is Aftab in the room anymore. Never mind. Anyway, so these are some of the sessions that are taking place. There's an AC annual meeting, um, the joint meeting with the board, as well as the session that is meant for uh, engagement. So if you're interested in what is going on in the ASO world, please uh, do tune in for these sessions. 
And of course, if you've never attended an ICANN meeting before or you've somehow never heard of us before, you can also join us as a newcomer. So for first timers, if you're a techie or a geek, you can join all these different sessions that tell you, you know, how the internet works, what's DNS abuse, what's going on with root server operations and governance, et cetera, et cetera, if you want to find out more. But I'm sure that all of you are quite familiar with these things already. And of course, we always have the newcomer day. Uh, which only happens for this meeting and the last meeting of the year. So the, the center meeting, the second meeting of the year, the policy meeting doesn't have this. So if this is really your first time coming to ICANN meeting, I do encourage that you join the Newcomers Day just to help you um, orientate yourself about what's going on. Other fun things you can do, it's not all just talking about policy and boring, boring stuff in the working groups. We have the welcome ceremony on the first day, on Monday. Then um, we have a gala dinner that is being hosted by our local co um, host committee um, that's happening uh, off-site from the main event. Uh, but we do have shuttle buses there, so do join us. It'll be very fun. Uh, and then at the end of the, uh, the meeting, we have the community wrap-up cocktail. So do have fun in the ICANN meetings. It's always massive, always lots of people. Uh, but we've always find that it's not just intensive and tiring, but also some, something that is very enjoyable for everybody. So after ICANN 64, life continues. Uh, especially in the APAC office, we still have uh, other regional events to look after. So one of them would be the GDD Industry Summit, which is coming to the APAC region for the first time. It will be taking place in Bangkok on 6th to 9th May. Uh, and if you're in the domain name industry, this is really the event to look out for. Then we have the Asia-Pacific Internet Governance Academy. We're coming back to Korea for that. And that is probably happening around the mid of the year, so maybe June, July period. Of course, we'll be part of the Asia-Pacific uh, Regional Internet Governance Forum, the APRIGF, uh, which Raj spoke about just now, that's happening in Vladivostok. So um, I hope to see more of you there. Um, if you're interested in internet governance issues, this really is the regional forum um, for us to discuss all these issues. And I think that's my last slide. So see you in Kobe uh, in just a few weeks' time. If you haven't booked your tickets but you're feeling the itch, I highly welcome you. Uh, also, if you haven't already done so but you want to attend the meeting remotely or otherwise, please register for the meeting. Um, and as you can see, remote participation is available. So I hope to also see you online. Thank you. This is very nice, Joyce, uh, catered content to the uh, APNIC community. Thank you. Uh, Sabrina from IANA. Thanks, Pablo. Hi, everyone. My name is Sabrina Tanimal. I work in IANA Services, and I'll be presenting the IANA Numbers Function Update today. To give you a quick update on our team, we now have 17 people working in IANA. About half the people in the team are responsible for processing requests and doing day-to-day -day operations, while the other half of the team are focused uh, in, um, excuse me, are focused on developing new systems and services and also working on business excellence. For our customer satisfaction survey, this is the seventh year we have done an annual customer satisfaction survey. The survey is divided into the different categories of customers we have, and the services we perform for the RIRs is one of the categories. The way we distribute the survey is for the RIRs, we send the survey to the RIR CEO and also the RIR registration services managers. Our participation rate, as you can see on the screen here, uh, for the survey for that particular category is 25% this year, which is about 10% lower than the previous year's average. And for those that did respond, we got 100% satisfaction rate. All of the five respondents reported they didn't have any customer service related issue in the past year. And accuracy and timeliness were ranked as the highest. So given the participation rate in the annual customer survey, which has declined over the years, along with the feedback that we got from our customers saying it makes it hard to provide input when the survey is sent months after we perform the service, um, which by then most don't remember what the request was about. 
So this has driven us to create a post-interaction uh, survey, HDWD, how did we do? And so this is something new that we're introducing in uh, 2019. And we're still evaluating whether people are excited about this approach or if this will dwindle down, but it's certainly helping us to know how we did and where we can improve. Moving on to reports, uh, we created a report which we share every month online at iana.org performance. This is the report for December, and just for your information, the January report is posted, but there were no requests for uh, January. So for December here, we have our occasional number allocation, and you're welcome to visit this page and look at the reports from month to month, and even look deeper at the exact timestamps for when we did certain actions in our uh, business process. For our audit programs, uh, it's a two-part audit, an audit of our systems that we use to deliver the INA functions, and an audit of our processes to ensure that our deliveries of our services are consistent with the processes. And uh, this is just how we fulfill our contractual obligations for at least two of the three IANA functions, the RIR and the IETF communities. And um, the, the 2018 audit report, which includes the number of resources services, was issued with no exceptions. And we also have a separate audit for the root zone KSK. This is also done on an annual basis and that report will be available to view in March. Um, another thing to note here is RSM replaced PricewaterhouseCoopers for 2018 audit program. And the next thing we want to share with you all today is we're currently working on an updated INR, Internet Number Resources uh, dashboard for RIR statistics, and this will replace the older ICANN research webpage. So, just to give a little bit of a background, uh, historically ICANN hosted this service called stats.research.icann.org, which you see on the screen, which used data provided by the RIRs to present a view uh, on usage of resources allocated by the IANA functions. Um, this tool is somewhat outdated. It relies on Adobe Flash, and over the last few months, we've received reports that it wasn't available. And as IANA staff, we use the staff, uh, excuse me, we use this data to confirm eligibility for allocations by the different RIR per the global policy. So in the last few months, um, we have set to modernize the tool to no longer rely on Adobe Flash for one thing, uh, but to also help us answer the questions for when we're making these allocations. And I should note that what you see on the screen here, uh, these are just example concepts and not actual screenshots. Um, so uh, this, this, replace, this is the replacement that we're working on right now. And uh, like I said, it, there will be no more reliance on Adobe Flash and it will be mobile friendly. And as you navigate through the dashboard, you'll be able to drill down for specific details for, um, uh, excuse me, you'll be able to drill down for specific details for each RIR. And there will be new visual gauges uh, to show what's available, as well as the stats for monthly average allocations. So we hope to have a beta of this available uh, by the next ICANN meeting in Kobe, and to hopefully give you a demo by then. And the last thing I have for you today is the last of the uh, address space of the recovered IPv4 pool will be done on March 1st, per the global policy, hence the empty cupboard unless somebody gives us anything back in the next few days, which is unlikely, but um, hopefully you won't give us any, any back, APNIC. Um, I've also listed the tool on GitHub for you to run on your own as to who's getting what. And that is all I have for you today. I'll be happy to answer any questions. Hi, I'm Nurani Nimpuno. I'm the chair of the IANA Review Committee. Uh, so after the IANA stewardship transition, um, it was decided to put together a, um, a committee representing the number community, all the five regions, and we look at these monthly reports and um, the RIRs put together a matrix based on that uh, to evaluate um, the services from um, IANA to the RIRs. Mm -hmm. And I just thought it might be worth noting here that they've like you say, there have been no incidents over the, the last year, and that was confirmed by the RIRs. 
We do ask uh, the community for comments uh, on, that, um, on that report, and we've received no comments, uh, which is maybe understandable, given that there are no um, incidents. So I just wanted to note that to people in the room and that there will be a report coming out in the coming month from us, basically stating this. Um, and that I'm very happy if people want to uh, give feedback on that process, on the team, on the committee, etc. And then finally, I just wanted to say thank you for great services. Um, I find personally the monthly reports very clear and very helpful. And the fact that it's out there for everyone to see, I think, is, is also um, a good thing. Um, and then this new tool set looks fantastic. So I'm looking forward to seeing that. Thanks. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sabrina and Murani. Um, Africa, Afrinic, Arthur. Thank you, Pablo. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Arthur Carandal Gesson. I'm the head of member service at Afrenic. I'll be giving you the presentation about some quick activities at Afrenic. I will try to be very short. The next slide. For those who don't know Afrenic, Afrenic is based in Mauritius. We are the fifth area, and currently the weather is very warm there. It's 27 degrees. So for those who want to spend their weeks or holidays, you are invited to come in Mauritius. <laughs> Quickly, regarding the membership, Afrenic has Rick. Uh, the above 1,000 and more than 600 members, and 158 were recruited last year. In terms of IP distribution, last year we distributed more than 6 million of IP4 addresses, and 72/32 IPv6 block addresses, and uh, 170 ASN number. Regarding the exhaustion of IPv4 address pool, we rake ex currently uh, 0 0.24 slash 8, which represents approximately 6 million of IPv4 address remaining in our pool. And uh, we, are, we have reached 30 slash uh, more than 38 uh, percentage of our last slash eight to reach our last slash 11, which represent our soft landing phase two. And uh, I will talk about two or three initiatives we are implementing right now is regarding uh, Afrenic adoption of uh, his internet routing registry. As you must be aware, uh, last year in September, RIPE has adopted a policy to not supporting now the creation of route six and out number object that is referred to resources out of the region. And based on that, AFNIC has adopted another policy at its side by removing all the need for SN number holders to authorize now any road object and routing object as well in its routing registry. And as you can see in the map here, we rake right now more than 19,000 objects registered. And you can see a sharp increase 
of the number of, of objects registered. And we have as well the policy that has been implemented, LEM delegation. In the name, LEM delegation uh, policy aims to correct all the reverse DNS that, are LEM, that has LEM delegation in our database. When the policy has been implemented, that generates a certain number of LEM delegation, and we put in place some automation that send a notification to all our members to take corrective action. And as we can see in the, the number there, we decrease the number from 40,000 to more than 30,000 at the end of December. We have as well uh, one activities or project called Member Contact Update. We, last year, we conduct a, a, a survey of contacting the members to ask them to confirm accuracy of the information in our database. And by the end of December, 92% of members confirm that the information in our database are created. So this year we are going to start again the same exercise. We have uh, currently three po IPv6 policies that has been implemented. Georgi present here can give you more information of that or you can go on our website. We have as well uh, a policy that rig the last call. That policy is about a clarification of IPv6 sub assignment. We have also four policies that are still under discussion. IFRENIC PDPBs, Internet Number Resource Review, Abyss Contact Policy Update, and Clarification on Temporary Resource Usage. Concerning IFRENIC Capacity Building Program, we already uh, train more than 700 engineers and managers from 21st, 21 countries in Africa. And uh, most of our capacity building was about IPv6 workshop, IPv6 deployment, desk. We are offering now IPv6 certification uh, online courses in French and English. We also conduct uh, Internet Number Resource Management and IRR workshop. And uh, we have put in place IPv6 Deploy Aton. We have uh, recently created a department called Research Innovation. They are collaborating right now with uh, RIPE. We have uh, five RIPE Atlas Encore sponsored and deployed. This department already published uh, three research papers on latency and content hosting, including a paper at the IE Infocom of last year. We have also, in collaboration with Vanilla and ISO, deployed a platform called WIDER that can give you some figures about internet measurement in Africa. We have also a program called FIRE, and for more information, you can go on our website. That program already supports five projects that has been approved, and the grant receive a total of $31,000. This is my last slide. We are organizing in uh, Kampala, is, uh, in Africa, our Internet Summit for 2019. So you are all invited to participate. As you can see on the picture, we have some very interesting Receipt, so you can come and uh, spend time with us and going in our local safari and develop your network. 
So thank you very much for your attention. This is my last slide. Any question? So thank you very much. Perfect timing, Axel. Hello, good afternoon. My name is Axel Pavlik. I'm the Managing Director of the RIPE NCC, which is APNIC's sister organization over there in Amsterdam. And I must say, you are my favorite people. You are my favorite people. It has been a very busy week. It has been a long day. You are still here sticking with us. Well done. Uh, we all know there are plenty full opportunities for you out there walking through the rain and you know, finding food and drink. Thank you for still being here. I promise I will give you a quick and short update on uh, what we are doing at the RIPE NCC. Not all of it. We're doing much more, but a couple of things that we um, put together for the community, a couple of things for our members, some uh, about resources and, and you know, coordination like that. So, um, one of the new things that we are about to roll out very carefully is more training. Um, our training services are very popular. We do lots of training courses all over the place, some of them online, um, and they're great, but also mm, well-meaning and not, not really delivering a thing to the, to the people about, about, apart from knowledge. So what we will do is we start with proctored online um, exams so that actually we can check that the right person does the uh, course and has, has the knowledge and they will get a badge, a sort of digital thing that they can attach to, I don't know, a social media sites that say that they have done the course and they have indeed the knowledge. We think that will be quite interesting um, and we have talked to um, key members of the community about this. Uh, we think there's quite a bit of support. What we will do is the content will be available as it is already to all of our stakeholders, all of the community. Um, the thing that uh, is then possibly to be paid for is the actual, actual exam. Uh, for members, it'll be, um, they, get, they get vouchers. Um, and additional bookings could be made using credit cards for people who are not members, for anybody who has an interest. Um, then there is an assessment platform. Basically, it'll look like you sit behind your computer being watched through the webcam in a secure browser thing, and uh, you do your exam. And then we know that you've done it, and you get your badge. So we'll do a soft, slow rollout around, we think, around the next Stripe meeting in uh, May, and then gradually learn, uh, produce the content for that as well. Uh, that turns out to be quite, quite a bit of work, of course, as well. Um, so yeah, that's exciting. Another exciting thing is the RPKI Deployathon that we will do in well, about a couple of days. Um, basically, um, pushing the RPKI activities out a bit. We had a couple of um, staff changes internally, and now Natalie Trenerman is looking at secure, the secure routing area, and, and clearly RPKI is part of that. So, uh, yeah, we are focusing on that again and, and pushing it out into the community. Speaking about RIPE meetings, this is not the last slide. It typically is the last one. Uh, it's not this time. Uh, we go to Iceland. Um, I hear it's a wonderful island. It doesn't have enough trees for my personal liking, but otherwise great scenery. Uh, also, they have conference centers, and we will sit inside for most part of the week, um, enjoying the 30th year of the RIPE community. There might be parties available there as well, uh, but also interesting other content. You're all very welcome. A little bit about policies. Um, similar to other parts of the world, we have heard the call for um, validation of the abuse, see abuse contact uh, information in the database. Uh, we have uh, started implementation on this in, uh, earlier this month. Uh, basically, we are relying on, on automated uh, tools there, but we foresee that there will be 
uh, quite a bit of manual intervention as well when people don't respond to us uh, on our request to update that information. So yeah, there's a little bit of extra stuffing going into this as well. But it's for the good of the internet, isn't it? Um, other ongoing policy discussions, um, similar to what we've heard a little bit earlier today, but not quite. Um, there is a current proposal that says, once we have run out of the slash 22s that we currently give out, we still have a little bit of space left, and occasionally we get some back or we take some back uh, from, from members that have closed. That little bit of address space we should then give out in uh, slash 24s. So that's being discussed currently. Some other things are going on as well. Um, you can read up on them if you, if you want to. Um, yeah, the membership slide, right? Up and to the right for us as well. Um, again, unprecedented growth. We had unprecedented growth also last year and the year before. It will end at some point, and we currently think, yeah, this will probably start to end um, next year. So we currently foresee that we run out of the last slash 22s around the well, beginning of next year, maybe the end of this year. Uh, but then we'll have 24,000 LIRs. That's a fairly large number. And we foresee there will be some slower growth or maybe some consolidation, probably some consolidation there as well. Because as we, as we know, this, this insane growth is fueled by the last IPv4 bits that we can give out. And yeah, we have some left, but again, not that many. Lots of transfers are going on as well, of course, as you can see. Um, that causes quite a lot of uh, work for us. Fine, we are here to, to work for our community, obviously, and for our members. Um, I don't know whether you've seen something like this. This basically says that most of the inter-area transfer flow comes out of the Aran region, probably because there's lots of legacy space there as well. Um, there's a little bit back and forth between RIPE NCC and APNIC. Hmm. Um, interesting to, to look at. So, uh, as I said, there's lots of work going into these kinds of, of, of transfers. Um, we see disputes, um, not typically maybe, but quite often people say, yeah, so the guy that told you to transfer our addresses away that, that you have done now, um, he didn't work for us anymore. And then we say, but it's in, it's in the registry that he, he's the contact. And they say, yeah, well, we didn't update that. You should have updated that, really. So again, there's a point keep in, in keeping your information up to date, helping us to deal with you, but also securing your own resources. Um, LIR accounts are hijacked, um, not only with um, falsified passports and, and papers like that, but you know, also looking at um, setting up fake um, very similar looking web pages, um, domains like that. It's quite a number of nasty stuff going on over the last couple of years, and it gets worse. Uh, we do report those things where we have clear uh, um, criminal intent. We report them to the, to the Dutch police. I don't know what that really does. Uh, maybe the Dutch police is too busy looking after stolen bicycles, or, or maybe not. Um, but we do this, and I think it's uh, something that we have to follow up on. So, oh yeah, another thing, uh, hijackers often, of course, target then resources, outdated contact details, thinking that people might not be watching, and um, again, keep your contact details up to date. Uh, we do close quite a number of uh, accounts um, <coughs> for various reasons. Um, some smaller things are happening, maybe repeatedly, so they get some final warnings. Um, yeah, we've done uh, two, 203 closures in, in 2018. That's quite a high number, and probably it's, it's going up for the time being. Um, yeah. So what does that mean, uh, apart from more work for us and cost for, the, for, for our members? Um, there are new, yeah, new, new entrance in, into the policy process over the last couple of years. And I think I see personally a change, occasionally a change in atmosphere on the policy mailing lists, where in the good old days when I came, I won't tell you when that was, um, last, last century actually, um, there were lots of people discussing and debating and working together, generally for the good of the internet, making things work, um, looking at those policies to optimize them in some way. And I, I feel that there are people now 
that optimize those, or try to optimize those policies for personal or financial gain, which has not that much to do with the um, optimality of the, of the internet. So we see quite a bit of, of yeah, di diversity there, some barking at each other, some ad hominem attacks. It's not the same atmosphere, certainly, that uh, we had in the good old days. Um, and you would say, yeah, that's just the engineers talking among themselves. They know how to take uh, the occasional uh, stab. But it's not only the engineers. It's also governments, regulators watching, law enf enforcement certainly watching. They are also coming to take part in the policy process, and they don't like it when they are shot down uh, on stage by some crazy engineers. They then think that the policy development process doesn't really work for them. And shouldn't they maybe regulate some of this? So we see this to be a trend. Um, quite likely we see some regulation in some of the many countries of our service region. We hope that when that happens, it's not contradictory because then what do we do? Um, what, we, what we now try to do is to educate our community a little bit. Um, and also to talk to those newbies, uh, government, regulators, law enforcement, and, and to educate and put them together into, into a smaller room at one table, hopefully, to understand each other's um, motivations. Things that we quite frequently hear is, oh, but the database wasn't made for the police force, so keep out. That might have been, it wasn't made for the police force 20 years ago, but the world has changed and it's being used by the police force, so uh, how can we say it's not for you? That's not very popular with them. So we need to listen to each other and, and talk to each other, and that's something that, that I will put some, some effort in, in our region. Um, right. I think that's it for now. Thank you for sticking with us. If you have any questions, I'll be around. You'll see me outside in the rain, also inside. I'll be back tomorrow. Talk to me. Thank you. Final presentation, Dan, from Aaron. Welcome. Hello, everyone. Uh, Dan Alexander, currently serving on Aaron's Board of Trustees. I'll move so through some of the initial slides rather quickly because they're, they're more background slides. You know, Aaron has a mission statement as a nonprofit member-based organization. It currently serves more than 38,000 organizations in the U.S., Canada, and uh, the Caribbean. Of course, it focuses on evolving, you know, the Aaron services and um, supporting the multi-stakeholder model for management, and also focuses a lot on um, education and outreach. That outreach often includes, you know, like the the public policy meetings, similar to the one here today. But Aaron also focuses on a number of on-the-road events, which are essentially smaller scale meetings that go to um, smaller locations that people wouldn't normally be able to travel to the, the main meetings. They have an opportunity to be engaged with Aaron, find out what's going on, and provide feedback. Aaron's also doing a lot of engagement with the, the Caribbean region. Uh, Bevel Wooding is a new member of the Aaron team, and he's focusing on facilitating a lot of involvement in the region, working with uh, the CTU, Caribnog, uh, Caribbean Internet Governance Forum, along with Canto. Caribnog is actually having their meeting in April, along with uh, the Aaron meeting. Axel had a very similar slide these are the, the transfers that are going on. Registration Services has been spending an awful lot of time working on these. As you can see, the, the bulk of the, the transfers are essentially going from Aaron out to RIPE and APNIC, which 
with the Aaron to APNIC transfers are, th are the large bulk of it. I think maybe some of the numbers might be slightly different than Axel's slide. I'm, I'm guessing that variance is just when the, the snapshot was taken on the stats. But in the end, the, the impact is the same. A lot of IPs moving from Aaron to APNIC. Aaron continues on, you know, moving forward with IPv6. You can see that, you know, 58, almost 59 percent of the members have IPv6. Of those members with v6, you know, 49.2 percent of the, the membership has both v4 and v6, but there's actually 557 members there, 9.6 percent of the membership, that actually only have IPv6. They don't hold any v4 resources. The advisory council has been doing a lot of work on a number of policies. These, these five policies are all adopted pending implementation. 2018-1 um, is the ability to transfer ASNs inter-region. 2018-3 focuses, it was really more of a cleanup. There, there used to be a, a policy for uh, really focused on like cable operators who would have to allocate a block of resources to a, a service area and then provision IPs to individual customers. That, that capability is not really required anymore now that there's no free pool and that those operators, you know, can still justify allocations via the, the transfers, so the Advisory Council was doing some cleanup there. 2018-4 is a clarification on sub-assignments that's very similar to proposal that was being discussed here today. And Prop 255 and 256, those are editorial changes, so the Advisory Council has the ability to um, change the, the policy manual when it's simply uh, a context change that's not changing the, the actual policy or, or the intent of, of the policy. So they were doing some cleanup work there. There's one policy currently in a recommended state. With the, the Aaron PDP, the recommended state is kind of that last step before the advisory council can um, send it to the board for adoption. This is one that will be presented next month in, at the, the policy meeting, I'm sorry, in April, not next month, because we're still in February, yeah. <laughs> Jet lag. Um, clarification to ISP initial allocations. This was um, some clarification work for, there still are, you know, new entrants that don't currently hold resources and they needed a means to qualify for an initial allocation. Uh, this proposal seek to address that. 2017-12 and 18-5 are draft policies. These two, 2017-12 was actually an adopted policy that was sent to the board, but the board remanded it back to the Advisory Council for some clarification on, you know, the impacts to its implementation. And that kind of spawned off into to two efforts here where the Advisory Council is working with the community on whether POCs should be created by the, the individuals that they are tied to or should upstream providers still be able to create POCs for their, their customers. 2017-12 deals with, you know, an upstream would still be able to create a POC, but the, the customer that has that POC tied to it would need to validate that, that POC, whereas 2018-5 essentially disallows that, that third-party creation. And if somebody wanted a, a record in who is that, that POC record would actually have to be created by the organization it's tied to. 
2018-6 is uh, just a clarification. A lot of organizations were interpreting the, the policy manual that they had to do uh, detailed reassignment records when it wasn't in fact the case. So the AC has been working on cleaning up that language so they it's easier for them to do uh, simple reassignments versus detailed reassignments. 2019-1 and 2019-2, they deal with the, the waiting list. The waiting list policy was actually suspended by the, the Board of Trustees over concerns of, of fraud. And these two um, proposals are the AC working on um, several options, whether it's limiting the, the size of the blocks that could be obtained via the waiting list or increasing the, the amount of time that anyone receiving a, a block on the waiting list would have to hold that, um, making it unavailable for future transfers. In addition to, to both of these proposals, the AC is putting together um, some additional documentation that's going to be discussed in April regarding a number of additional possible um, mechanisms or levers that they could use to, to manage the waiting list going forward. 2019-3 is uh, an update to section 410 of the, the policy manual. That, that policy dealt with um, transition space or small blocks that could be allocated of V4 space to facilitate like V6 to, or V4 to V6 transitions. Uh, the original version of that block or of that policy had the ability to hand out blocks as small as a slash 28, which is not really practical given, you know, most people cannot route that on, on the larger internet. So this was an attempt to, to clean that language up. In addition to the, the policy work that's being done, um, Aaron's staff is looking to deploy a new version of their website next month or the end of this week. Um, they also are doing a lot of work with um, the consultation process. The, the Aaron consultation process is essentially a way for the community to provide feedback to Aaron that's not related to policies but related to their services. And there's a number of efforts that staff is currently working on around the, the consultations. Finally, the upcoming meetings. We've got Aaron 43 coming up in April in Barbados. As I mentioned before as well, um, Caribnog will be there and in October, we will be in Austin along with Nanog. And that's it. Thank you very much for your presentation. Uh, my name is Akinori Maimura of JPNIC. I, I, I'd like to have the slide uh, one page back, I think. I uh, know, uh, okay. Um, I'm I'm a bit curious about uh, the the number of, number four item of the uh, 2018 consultations. It's it says uh, are in board expansion. Then uh, it's uh, my understanding is that the are in board uh, has been ex expanded to the to have the member of the eight. Then uh, the, what, what, what is the contents of this consultation of number four? The the expansion you're referring to, you mean the, the special appointment? Or? Mm -hmm. uh, special appointment? So that's, okay. that's there are two separate things. Uh -huh. One, the, the board appointed yeah. um, a member to represent the Caribbean region to have input there. Yeah. That is, a, is an appointment. Mm -hmm. The item number four that you're seeing there, there was actually a consultation regarding the actual expansion of the number of seats on the board. So, you know, currently the, the six board members, yeah. there, okay. was, there was a suggestion to expand the size of the board, uh -huh. um, essentially, I believe, to nine. Mm -hmm. uh, 
um, that didn't receive any support. So oh, okay. that kind of you know, just ended there. Okay. Thank you very much. Any other questions? Thank you. I'm just looking at the NPT, NTP clock uh, over there, and uh, we are almost exactly on time. I can uh, drift a bit for the last few seconds, but uh, let's finish it here. Thank you very much.